So a long, long time ago, in a galaxy far away. A long, long time ago, in a galaxy far away. Music videos really used to matter. I know MTV is just a vestige of its former self, but uh, MTV used to kind of like make or break artist careers. It was a cable TV station that started in the early 80s that pioneered the concept of the music video as an art form. Bands were certainly doing music videos before MTV, but they were done more so in the sense of this is a promotional item for record labels rather than let's shock and awe people with our amazing visual content. The videos that came out before MTV were rather quaint, if I'm being generous. They were bad. And then this new cable TV network comes along and the whole music industry was disrupted. Now, it's not enough to just have a great sounding song on the radio. You have to look good, be able to act to a certain extent, and sometimes there's even a plot or storyline. This was a lot of bullshit that most bands had no interest in taking on, but then Michael Jackson came along and made everyone feel stupid that they hadn't been trying harder to capitalize on this new medium. Essentially creating miniature movies, Michael Jackson was able to prove the value of taking music videos seriously. After the likes of Billie Jean and Thriller, MTV was handily cemented as an institution that could potentially make or break artists depending on how their video looked. And to MTV's credit, they were able to wear that crown of legitimacy for a solid 20 years until they realized that, uh... The real money was to be made in producing low-cost reality TV shows. I mean, come on. Come on. Who, who doesn't know that? Do it. I'm ignoring your ratchet ass. This is ratchet. Your friend's ratchet, and she races, and she's homophobe. She no. said shut the f*** up. Don't tell her come make me. I was alive towards the tail end of MTV still being relevant. Hell, they even played music videos when I was a kid. But for me, it was mainly MTV2 where they were still trying to keep the dream alive as their parent station was all but chomping at the bit to dump all their music video content in favor of cheaper, higher rated reality TV shows like 16 and Pregnant and the only show still on the station to this day, Ridiculousness. Because I always thought it was called getting beamed. Right, like, like... I thought that too, but I think it's binged. So yeah, in the early 80s, music videos could really change the fortunes of many bands, for better or for worse. Many of the new romantic movement bands like Duran Duran greatly benefited from the MTV treatment. But there was one classic rock stalwart who got legendarily butt-fucked by simply releasing a music video. A video that was quite different from the image that most people had in their minds of this individual. This video single-handedly smashed the perception of this artist so much that this man's career took a nosedive that he never recovered from. The music video for Billy Squire's Rock Me Tonight was received so poorly that not only did it kill any future record sales or concert performances for the artist, but MTV went on to rate it as their worst music video of all time. Let's parse through this disaster and figure out how a single music video could ruin an artist's career. This is Dancing with Ghosts. Billy Squire was an up-and-coming rock star in the early 1980s who had some great AM radio bangers that are still played on classic rock radio to this day. The music videos that accompanied them were basically just mock live performances, much in the same way many other bands did at that time. Some of my favorite bands adhered to these same guidelines, such as the infamous Rush Robe videos. Billy Squire had started out in several bands before finally striking out on his own. Being on the same record label as Kiss, he was afforded opportunities to open for the band and eventually graduated into his own band bearing his namesake. In rapid succession, Billy Squire would put up several massive classic rock radio staples released in short order amongst three albums. 
But it was in 1984 that Billy Squire would entrust the new single for his upcoming fourth album, Signs of Life, with director Kenny Ortega. That's when things took an irreversible turn for the worst. So it's 1984. Put yourself back in that time. The term LGBTQ wasn't even a term that existed in mainstream America. It's just the fact that I have to preface my statement with that former statement kind of shows you where I'm going with this. Not saying that it's right, but let's just say 40 years ago, people were a wee bit more close-minded when it came to their favorite rock stars portraying themselves as anything but macho. On top of that, it was just one of those things to where, honestly, like the imagery in the video didn't at all match the sound of the artist. Here's some choice clips to show you just what I'm talking about. So right away, we're greeted with a hairless twink in silk sheets. I mean, this this video is perfect fodder for a good Beavis and Butthead episode. Now Billy is crawling around on the floor. Dude is literally prancing around. He, he, he is prancing. There's no other way you can describe that movement other than prancing. Now, now, if all that wasn't bad, now he's donned a pink tank top and is dancing very flamboyantly. I mean, if this were a Culture Club video, nobody would bat an eye, but this was Mr. Macho 80s Rockstar. Okay, now, I gotta draw... This, this would be an awkward choice even to this day, honestly. Not because of a dude wearing a pink tank top or anything like that, but, like, brand marketing... This isn't the brand. Why are you making these choices? It comes across as a parody. But a parody, it was not. This was the actual music video, and it was sold to the general public as the new Billy Squire hit song, and it was a hit on radio. This single killed it on the radio. But it was that pesky MTV thing that I mentioned earlier that sealed Billy's casket and buried it six feet down. The uh, homophobia? The sissification? I don't know what you want to call it. Maybe it was the almost mocking the fans with such a feminine portrayal of a genre that was still very macho and masculine that just upset fans so very much. But whatever it was... The fans voted with their wallets. Billy Squire went from selling out arenas to barely drawing an audience. This one artistic misstep caused Billy to fire both of his managers and to give director Kenny Ortega a piece of his mind. After this album cycle, Billy would take a year off, probably to avoid the slings and arrows that would surely be launched in his direction as he tried any attempt at all at redeeming his image. In 1986, Billy would release his next album, Enough is Enough, probably in reference to the brutal beatings he got in the press. Enough is Enough tanked sales-wise, and honestly, Billy Squire was never able to recover. Perhaps that's why you've never heard of him. Given the massive success of his earlier work, however, Billy stayed in the public eye to a minor extent, dropping albums to little fanfare, but he did collaborate with Freddie Mercury. But yes, this one music video seemingly killed the career of Billy Squire. And we know it was the music video because the song was doing gangbusters on rock radio until this pesky video came out. It's sad, really. Uh, Nowadays, that just wouldn't happen. But again, this is 1984. Gender norms were still fully ingrained in the hearts and minds of most everybody on the planet. This band was marketing itself as ballsy hard rockers, and to release something like this was seen as some kind of sick betrayal. I personally really like the Billy Squire songs I've heard. I think he had a great rock voice and helped elevate the status quo for rock music at the time. His song, The Big Beat, has been sampled numerous times because of the extraordinary quality of the recorded drum groove at the beginning. Even to today's standards. Hell, Eminem sampled The Stroke in his 2011 song, Berserk. At the end of the day, I think Billy is financially just fine, but 
He probably wishes he had made different choices in regards to whose hands he put his career into. Here's some audio from an Eddie Trunk interview recently where he discusses the whole debacle of the Rock Me Tonight music video scandal. I wanted the video to be a thing um, where the idea of Rock Me Tonight, I wanted it to focus on the idea that, or, or try to build a bond between me and my audience. And by that I mean that I wanted to put something together where we were all going after the same thing. I would be, in my world, getting ready to go out at night. In New Jersey, kids would be getting ready in their world to go out at night, sneak out or do whatever. And I wanted to have this sort of meeting where the kids, you know, or you know, got out of their regular world, came into the city, came out of the subways, you know, walked over manholes and became little rock stars, going to a club, where I'm playing and I go to the club and then we're all together. That was kind of my mm -hmm. basic idea. You know, I'm in my apartment and I've got, you know, I've got the song, you know, I got the, the songs on the radio, you know, so, so I'm listening to it and I'm doing my hair and stuff like, just like the kids do. Like every, we all, the idea was I wanted us all to be this, like a very communal thing that we're all in the same ritual. We all love the music and we all, are trying to transform ourselves into who we want to be, you know, and it all comes together that we're in the same place. And then, so we like this idea. And Bob Giraldi liked the idea until a couple of weeks later when he suddenly decided to plow the project and he said that he wouldn't want his children seeing that. That he, I, I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure what he saw in this that would have been so horrible because there was no, right, you know, there, there was, there was nothing, uh, macabre or dark about it at all. He had a guy working for him named Kenny Ortega, who's a choreographer, who I had met before. And Kenny really wanted to become a director. And so Kenny was a very good friend of my girlfriend's, and Kenny approached my girlfriend and said, you know, I would really like, really like to do this video, and I've got an idea. And I knew Kenny, and Kenny is, is a great choreographer, by the way. So Kenny comes, and he says, I've seen you perform all these times. And he said, he said, what do you think about doing something where we choreograph your moves, the things you, you know, that you do on stage when you're not playing guitar and stuff, and things, it's things that you do. And I'll put them together, and we'll put it to the music, and then we'll do what you're saying about having you in the room, you know, and then going out. And somehow we, we lost, I think we lost the idea of the kids because... I don't know if it was because we were running out of time or we were trying to simplify it or whatever, but it started then focusing on this new kind of performance where there would be this thing of you know, me getting ready to go out and then hooking up with the band and playing. And I, that kind of appealed to me because, again, I was trying to sort of push the limits of what I was doing, you know, and I felt like, well, if you just take stuff that I do anyway, that, that could be cool, and I'll end up playing guitar, and, you know, I'm not trying to be like a dancer. It's just a different thing, and we put me, put me in the apartment and... I'll fix my hair and do all that, you know, that stuff, and the song will be going, and it'll, it'll still be cool. But, you know, to be honest, we did a lot of preparation for it, or I thought, I thought we were all on the same page, and I showed him movies of how I wanted it to look and things like that. And, you know, he ended up just totally misrepresenting it. You know, I walked on the set, and all those pastels and satin sheets and stuff, it was like, what is this, what is this about? You know, it's completely, he had an image for me that was not the image I had of myself. You know, he he saw this as a real pop, Tom Cruise, risky business kind of thing, you know. And I saw it as Richard Gere and American Gigolo when I told him that, you know. And basically, he just didn't do it. And But now, you have to realize at this point... You're three guys in, and you need to make a yeah, video. Yeah, and, the, and, the, and the, the video is scheduled to come out in two weeks. Right. And it's a world premiere, and nobody wants to push it back. Now, you know, in retrospect... I could have said, screw it, I'm not doing it, and it's going to be pushed back. Ironically, or interestingly enough, not so ironic, or interestingly enough, Springsteen did the same thing. Springsteen reshot, at the same time, Dancing in the Dark. He had done it, and it was terrible, apparently, and he scrapped it. So anyway, if you've seen the video, what do you think? It's undebatably a monstrosity, given the vibe he was going for, but I don't know, maybe one of you guys out there can form some sort of justification as to why this video works. I'm not seeing it. And God knows this isn't the first time a bad video happened to a good song. However, this is kind of the first time a bad video ruined an artist's career. 
Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, have a good rest of your night.